Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family, readers and viewers. Today, Dick and I are delighted once again to have with us the Los Angeles County, current Los Angeles County District Attorney incumbent, George Gascon, who is running again for another term. Welcome, George. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon and Dick. It's great to see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Same here. So, Dick, do you want to start? Uh, sure. So uh, to get elected, you led a wave for restorative justice against cash bail, against the traditional uh, lock them up and throw away uh, approach that, that district attorneys often use to get elected. But now a few years later, kind of the conversation has changed. Now the, the talking heads, the right wing talking heads, the op-ed pages, the conversation is that my God, crime is out of control. Los Angeles is a horribly dangerous place to live. And even though you've said, and it's true, that's mostly a lie, you have to fight it. How are you going to fight it? Well, you know, I'm glad that you you asked that question, Dick, because this is an area that we have been dealing with from the, from the very beginning of my administration. But this is something that we continuously see. This is a, this is a playbook to this, right? That's been going on for for a long time where generally very uh, right-wing, you know, conservative groups uh, attack progressive, whether it's on the economy, whether it's on public health or public safety. And, and generally it's this fear mongering narrative about, you know, things are not working and, you know, every, you know, we're falling apart, we're less safe. Um, and the reality is that we know that the data doesn't support that. We know that actually, uh, violent crime is, uh, you know, significantly down in, in L.A. and L.A. County. Um, and it is so, quite frankly, in many jurisdictions around the country that are run by progressive. In fact, generally speaking, uh, those places that are run by progressive prosecutors have lower per capita uh, violent crime rates that, that, that compare with jurisdictions that are run by very conservative, the, you know, the more traditional prosecutors. So... What we learn in this process is that while data is important to have, data cannot be the entire narrative. So we, we have to address people where they are. You know, uh, there was a recent, uh, you know, an iteration of Gallup poll that has been tracking since the early 60s about how people feel about crime. And generally, spe generally speaking, in, in this country, people have always felt unsafe, no matter what the numbers are, whether crime was up or down, people generally feel unsafe. So there's evidence that there is a disconnection between where the reality may be and how Americans feel about crime. And the, the right wing has been very good at, at uh, you know, picking up that narrative and, and, and frankly, uh, you know, uh, forcing it and, and, and creating this, this environment that feeds into that fear. So what we're doing is we're you know, we're using the data, but we're also acknowledging where people are. And then we're trying to sort of break it down and work with them through what are the things specifically in your neighborhood, in your particular uh, environment that are making you feel unsafe, and then trying to address those. And sometimes there will be things that are problematic. I mean, there is no question that we have seen an increase in car thefts in the last two years. And that's a cycle, by the way, if you look back at the last 30 or 40 years, it goes up and down. But we are seeing an interesting uh, pattern with car theft. And by the way, it's not a local problem. It's a national problem. You know, a lot of kids are actually posting themselves on TikTok as they're stealing cars. They're showing how to steal a car. They will drive the car for a while. They go out and do kind of the joyriding thing, and then they dump the cars. But what we're seeing is we're seeing... Uh, primarily, there are certain types of cars that are more likely to be stolen. Kias, uh, Hyundais, certain older models that, that are very easy to bridge their security systems and get the car started. So addressing that problem is very different than, for instance, years ago when we were having very high-end cars that are being stolen, they were being stripped or they were being shipped overseas, right? The latter is a is the product of you know kids you know uh, maybe getting their enjoyment out of things that we would prefer that they didn't and and uh, and the and the and the other one you know or I should say the, the you know latter the, the the more organized stuff is you know it's organized crime right so how you deal with one as opposed to how you deal with the other are different 
but acknowledging the fact that it's occurring and then handling it is important. Organized retail theft. People are horrified because they see the videos of the smash and grab. The questions there are more complicated, right? We have seen recently, which is something we suspected all along, that the industry has, has inflated the numbers of the losses. We also know that, you know, we have very graphic videos of mobs going into a particular shopping center and grabbing thousands of dollars of merchandise and running away. By the way, again, not an LA problem. It's a national problem. In fact, I, I often challenge people when they talk about this stuff. I said, you know, do a Google on, on YouTube and say organized retail theft Houston, organized retail theft Miami, and you will immediately see the videos. And we see those videos play over and over again, and it gives a sense of insecurity, and people have a tendency to all associate in locally. So you could be viewing a smash and grab in Miami and all of a sudden in your Instagram feed and you think it's happening next door to you. Uh, so addressing that, yes, we have the smash and grab, and we are working to aggressively to, to eliminate those, but also understanding the scope of that and trying to walk this fine line of educating people is much more nuanced and more complicated. So, you know, basically what we're doing is we're using data, but we're also acknowledging people in the areas where they have fear and we're addressing those. You know, we continue to have a problem with houselessness in our community and the feel of insecurity when you walk around your neighborhood and you see tents around your neighborhood and you may see somebody that is talking to a wall or is half naked, you know, that creates a, a fear and a sense of insecurity that is well justified. The criminal legal system has very few tools to deal with the issues of houselessness or mental health. So bringing the conversation to the table, not ignoring it, acknowledging that that is a concerning pattern, and then trying to address it through the different vehicles that we have to get in order to create more housing, create more, more capacity to deal with mental health, educating people as to how a concrete box in a county jail for 24 or 48 hours or even a month it's not gonna fix somebody's mental health problem. They will come back and they will be in a worse shape maybe that the day that they went into jail. And then from there talking about how we need, in our case, our county board of supervisors and other jurisdictions to increase funding for mental health beds, which is, you know, it's occurring. It's just occurring at a very slow rate, right? So it's, it's all these conversations that need to be had. The, 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 Unfortunate part about all this is that it takes a tremendous amount of uh, retail work, if you will, talking to a lot of smaller groups. And, and that requires in a jurisdiction of over 10 million people like ours, it requires that we have surrogates that can actually speak very articulately about these issues because it cannot all be me, right? You know, we're doing this video today and you have your, your, your followers that would view it. But we know that there, you know, there are a lot of other people out there that won't, right? So it's just trying to address it by going, uh, using multiple mediums, including other folks, to be able to educate our public and push back on the narrative that, that quite frankly, is not only unhelpful, but I, I, I believe it's actually very damaging to the well-being of our community. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that answer. You know, a lot of the things that you just addressed uh, we have a friend, professor, a law professor at um, USC, and he talks, he calls those things criminogenic, and I'm looking over here at my notes, criminogenic social conditions. When people are complaining about um, the social conditions that actually create, support, facilitate property crime, some of those social conditions are unemployment. Um, if you look at the uh, unemployment for black male teens, it's yes. um it's off the charts and people yes. don't want to talk about that. Well, if you look at what has happened in real estate development in Los Angeles County, how it's just impossible for people to buy homes and rents have skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of social conditions that um, set the stage for property crimes, even though property crimes are down, um, but those things do set the stage and you don't really have any control over that. I want to ask you a little bit about uh, something that is falls along the realm of economics, which is cash bail. Um, you know, you you ran on that last year. Talk to us about your position on cash bail. 
Look, I have been uh, I've been opposed to cash bail for a very long time. In fact, I was the first elected district attorney back in 2014 to publicly uh, say that we needed to get rid of cash bail. Uh, and to that end, we started doing work in San Francisco and, and, and partnered with people in New Jersey and other jurisdictions that had already gone down the path of getting rid of cash bail. Now, cash bail is often misunderstood, uh, and, and there's a couple of components. Number one, people sometimes believe that that means that everybody's going to get out of jail pre-trial, regardless of whether they're dangerous or not. And that is not the case. Really, when we're talking about eliminating cash bail, what we're saying is, if there is a, a, a determination that you're dangerous or that you're likely not to return to court when you're due to return to court, then you should be held back in custody or there should be some other arrangements. It could be electronic monitoring or some other type of arrangements to ensure that you're not going to be dangerous. If you're not dangerous and there is no indication that you will not return, meaning that you will come back to court to deal with whatever the allegations are, then the reality is that we don't gain anything in terms of public safety by holding you back but we actually can create more insecurity. So for instance, when we hold people back um, that are not dangerous and that would come back, uh, they often lose their job. And if they lose their jobs, then they cannot pay the rent and then they become houseless. Uh, often two people when they're being held back in pretrial confinement, they will not put an aggressive defense. So there are people that perhaps didn't commit the crime or maybe didn't commit all the crimes that are being alleged, but they'll they'll agree to a plea agreement uh, in order to get out without thinking about the consequences of that, how that is going to impact their ability to get employment, housing, education at a later date. So there are many components to this that are actually, in essence, they're really unconstitutional in a way that, you know, the presumption that you're innocent until proven guilty goes out the door when we hold you back uh, before you're proven guilty, right? So getting rid of cash bail is really addressing the component of the unfairness of the process. Not as a, it's not about releasing dangerous people. So that's number one. But number two, and the one that people really do not understand, in our system, the courts determine whether you're going to get out of jail pre-trial or not. So for instance, in LA County, the county, uh, the, the county superior court has determined that they're going to get rid of cash bail in many cases where you have uh, non-serious, non-violent offenses. And they're doing it, by the way, because they have determined that cash bail actually has unconstitutional components to it, number one. Number two, they are following the law. But more importantly, the district attorney doesn't control any of that. It is really up to the courts, it's up to the judge to determine this. So while, yes, I do not believe in cash bail, and yes, I have a policy that we try to avoid it, at the end of the day, the courts can go in whatever direction they want to go and educating the public to understanding that. And then, you know, finally, and I haven't even gone down this path, the court is actually keeping data in LA County as to the results of the early stages of the policy and what we're seeing is not only it's not causing any more crime, but people are returning when they're due to return in greater numbers per capita than the people that are being held back under the cash bill configuration. And, you know, we have examples of people that, that actually uh, are released with cash bail and they go out and reoffend. And generally they, they do some really horrible things. We had a murder uh, late last year. This guy committed five follow home robberies. He was released on the first four. He posted collectively a half a million dollars because he had the cash. He was stealing it from people. And then on the fifth time, he wound up murdering the victim. Under a no cash bail risk-based detention, this guy probably after the first or the second time would have been held without cash bail. And he would have been held in custody until he faced the consequence of the first charges. Under the cash bail system, he kept bailing and keep deferring, never faced the consequences, and eventually wound up murdering someone. So just because you put somebody in a situation where they can get out by posting bail, it doesn't mean that they're not going to go out there and harm someone. There's no connection between how much money you have in the bank and whether you're dangerous or not. So so even though you're a former police officer yourself, you, you campaigned on, on the idea that you would do a better job of holding 
law enforcement officers responsible, accountable for any misdeeds. Can you discuss how your office has been able to follow through on those campaign promises? Of course, Dick. First of all, let me begin by saying that the majority of the police officers in our community and every community go out every day, they work under very difficult conditions, and they do incredible work. So that's the first thing. But what is really important to understand is that police officers, just like doctors or prosecutors or judges, we are given positions that have incredible amount of responsibility. And we're giving social authority over many things that have a tremendous impact in our community. And unless we are willing to hold ourselves accountable to the fact that, yes, we're held to a higher standard, and when we violate that trust, we have to be held accountable, socially, the social compact between the public and these institutions starts to break down and people lose face in our work. So in our work, what we have done is we began the path of addressing that. If you look at the 20 years prior to my administration in LA County, under two different administrations, two police officers were prosecuted for excessive force. Since I took office in the last three and a half years, we have now, we have 15 cases involving excessive use of force by police officers that are in the court system. In addition, we have about 90 cases involving a variety of other on-duty misconduct, most of them, by the way, including you know, involving perjury, lying on police reports, lying on the stand, you know, all the things that actually take away from the good work that the men and women in uniform do every day. So addressing these issues is not something that is anti-police or anti-public safety. To the contrary, it's very pro-police. It's actually providing an avenue for good policing to flourish and ensuring that those, a small minority of people that decide to violate the law, that they're being held accountable so that we increase the credibility of our system. And we have done it and we will continue to do this work because it's critically important to the sustainability of our system. Great, thank you so much. Um, when you initially came in and still to this day, there was a lot of pushback from within your own department. Can you give us an update on um, how your own department is working with you now? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is shifting the culture of a large organization takes time. And this is the largest prosecutor's office in the country. You know, we have about 2,000 employees. At one point, we had about 900 lawyers. We lost 100 positions were taken out of our budget during COVID. Uh, so we were down to about 800. And right now we have somewhere around 725 lawyers. Uh, a, a couple of things to this. Number one uh, is addressing internally, educating and, and, and promoting and, and giving people the opportunity to grow for those that are willing to, to shift or, or see that the work needs to evolve into a different place. And we have increasingly created a management team that is very aligned with you know, what I call the 21st century model of prosecution, which is our work is not just simply locking people up. It's actually about providing for safety, not only the safety and accountability to our victims today, but to victims and the safety of tomorrow. The second part of that is hiring a different kind of prosecutor. And to that end, you know, we've been very successful. We've now hired about 85 new lawyers and we've hired almost 30 support staff during the last three years. And we're on, we're on target to hire another 100 lawyers uh, this, uh, in 2024 as we promote and we create additional vacancies at the entry level. But what is really critical for me is, for instance, we've, uh, you know, we've interviewed approximately 500 or uh, people that have applied to become lawyers. We've only hired about 85. I interview every single entry level lawyer position. And I do that because I think it's important for me to see the person, because we're not just simply looking for people that are uh, technically capable, frankly, under our status, uh, under, our, under our requirements. All you have to do is have a bar card and be in good standing. And that to me is not enough. For me, I want people that want to think about the work in a different way that are willing to evolve 
from where we were. And what we're finding is that we're very attractive for a lot of a lot of lawyers. We're getting a lot of lawyers from neighboring jurisdictions that come in apply that we're hiring. We're getting a lot of young people that are coming out of law schools. But the ones that we're hiring are the ones that are coming with a different thought process. Yes, they are concerned about public safety, but they understand that public safety is much more complicated than just simply prosecuting someone to the maximum allowed by the law. And that process creates a new culture within the organization. So when you look at the people that we're promoting, the people that we're putting in positions of responsibility and the people that we're hiring, we're shifting the culture of the organization and it will take another four to six years to get to the place where it will be, this thing will run on its own. But you know, the first four years, especially when you consider we were on lockdown under COVID for two years. And the fact that we have been able to hire about 85 new lawyers and they were on target to hire another 100 in 2024 is substantial. And it's a substantial percentage of our workforce. So I had a sense that you have a vision we interviewed you a couple of years ago when you were, um, well, I guess yeah. right after you right after you took office. Right. And you seem to have a vision. You have something that you're trying to achieve. I'd like to know, have you um, introduced new training for the new hires or for the people who currently were in uh, working for you now? You know, how, how do you turn the Titanic? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, uh, great question, Sharon, and we have. And I'll be the first one to admit not enough yet because we have been, you know, again, the first two years were so difficult with COVID, um, but we have done a great deal revamping our training unit and we'll continue to do so. Uh, we're doing the same thing with uh, the, uh, the, the in-service training. We're bringing speakers. We're bringing, you know, training that speaks about, you know, the issues of uh, racial inequality, the impact of race in our work, how to understand implicit bias. So there's a lot of work that is being done internally to shift the way that we train and that we manage our workforce, as well as how we do with the entry-level uh, work. But I, I'm, I'm not satisfied with that. We haven't done enough. Uh, I believe that we're on a better path as we move forward. I just recently, we did. Uh, we had some vacancies, so we reorganized. We we have a chief of staff now that is going to be running our training and running our, our hiring process, um, and she has a very clear vision of what that looks like. So we are we you know we continue to evolve uh, the organization as we build more of a uh, a stronger uh, bench, if you will, of people in positions of responsibility as well as what we're hiring. So I look, I'm very excited about 2024, frankly, and I'm very excited about the next cycle. Uh, because again, you know, if you consider organizational experts would tell you that large organizations take anywhere from six to eight years to, to alter a culture sustainably. And, and we're in that process, but we got a lot of work to do. Right. So, so I, I, I thank you. So, so uh, if people want to support your candidacy, your re-election candidacy, can you suggest some ways they might go about that? Yeah, you know, we we have a website. It is you know Gascon for DA. I mean, you can Google it, and I I recommend people go there. There are opportunities there for people to volunteer. People certainly to contribute. Uh, there are also educational opportunities there, you know, to learn about the work. Uh, more importantly, if you're unsure about some of the things that I'm telling you in terms of the scope of the work, I also encourage you to go, not for the political side, but for the educational side, to go to our DA website and, and look at, you know, the information of the work that we're putting together. Uh, so there are multiple paths, but I think if you go on our website also on the, uh, going back to the campaign, you can register there. And we will put you in our email thread so you're going to continue to get emails showing you some of the things that we're doing, sort of the latest information. So uh, I, I, we definitely, you know, we're, we're running a grassroots campaign. We know that there is going to be a tremendous amount of money put against me. Uh, you know, they're the, the same forces that tried to, uh, you know, recall me and that fought me on the first election are fighting and there's more, right? We anticipate... A, a very MAGA style 
uh, individual that you know will be running against me. I think that you know the 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 primaries are increasingly looking like uh, it will be myself and a, and a Republican uh, that will be running against me. Um, and when you look at the entire field of people running against me today, they're all running to the right, even the ones that are you know sort of dressing up as a as a as a progressive when you when you get through their their talk and when you look at their past work, you see right through that. You know, you'll often hear things, you know, I believe in reform, but safety first. And, you know, I say, well, you know, reform and safety actually are one of the same. If you really want to have sustainable safety, you have to reform the system. Over policing, over prosecuting, it's not created a safer, has not created a safer community. So even those that try to talk the, the progressive talk, when you look at their past performance as prosecutors, whether federal or state, uh, the way they prosecute cases until recently and how they were, uh, how they would approach the work, you can see that there are you know significant gaps there. And then from there, you get to the other side that is way to the right that really wants to go back to the past and worse. Um, you know, so we we know that this fight is really an ideological fight as much as it is about safety. I believe that we're on the right side of history. I believe that you know the the inequalities and the the over incarceration that has occurred in the last several decades has not been the answer. Frankly, if it were, we would not be having this conversation, right? We would be the safest nation in the world, but we're not. And we're not because we have created some of the highest levels of recidivism of any nation in the world because we over criminalize people and we don't attend to their needs and provide the right levels of interventions. So we know that there will be a ton of money coming after me. We are not expecting that we will raise the same level of money, but we are expecting to have a very strong grassroots campaign. And to that end, our endorsements that keep coming in, you know, we we have the, not only the County Democratic Party endorsement, but we have also the County Labor Federation. We have to this date out of, you know, about 17 or 18 clubs, uh, Democratic clubs around the county have endorsed me. Uh, only one hasn't that was endorsing in this race. Uh, labor unions, I have, I believe it's about 16 labor unions now. Again, all the labor unions that are endorsing in this, other than police unions, are endorsing me. So we are building this momentum uh, because we know that the way that we're going to succeed in 24 is going to be the same way we succeeded in 20, which is with a grassroots. It's people doing the door knocking, people calling, people talking to their neighbors and friends. And that's the type of campaign that we plan to run. Well, we wish you the best. Um, everyone should understand this election that we're talking about is a primary election in March. So everyone should be registered. If you want to participate, you got to register. And I think the, the deadline for registration is coming up pretty soon. It's sometime in February. Yes. Yes, it is, Sharon. The, the election day is actually March the 5th. Uh, and, you know, there, there are plenty of MAGA style candidates, not only in my race, but other race. So it's really important that if you feel that our democracy is in jeopardy, if you feel that you want to make sure that we stand up for democracy, whether it's in DA's office or presidentially, it's important that you register and you do vote. Thank so, yeah, thanks so much, George. This was wonderful. Exactly what we were hoping to hear. Thank you so much. And you. we wish you the best. We'll be waiting on pins and needles to see how it turns out in March. Take care, Thank George. You, so much. you guys take care, too. We'll see you. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.